Good morning. I'm Tom Klitgaard. I'm a lawyer in San Francisco. But I was what you would call an old China hand. I've been going there since 1979, with the, first with Senator Feinstein when she was mayor, and then back and forth many times on the business. And I had a, something I'd like to just start. It's going to be boring a little bit, but maybe we'll start this way. And I want to thank you for all the teachers for coming here because you are so valuable to understanding China. And every little bit of knowledge you get will help somebody someday and help your students. And in, in, in China, there's a saying, uh, a character says, Zhu Xin Xue Xi. And that, that means let your heart have some space to be filled with ideas. And if you think you know everything, you will learn nothing. So maybe that would work with your students. I just want to talk briefly about China, because I was there from the beginning. And put it in perspective. I'm going to talk, first of all, history a little bit. We talk about the economics. There are some fantastic changes that are happening in Chinese law. And if you were the king, and if you were the prime minister or queen, what would be your main job? What would be the main thing that when you woke up in the morning, you'd be thinking about? Would it be the environment? How about it? No, how about you? We'd all be thinking about keeping our job, right? <laughs> right? And the last thing we'd want is a bunch of dissidents outside our house banging on the door, or people thinking that we're doing a lousy job and throwing us out of office. OK? So that's number one, keep your job. Now, number two, if we look around and we say, what are some problems here? What are our people upset about? And how do we deal with this? But mo most of all, we'd want to have a set of rules. You, how many of you have rules for your classroom? When, you come to, when they come to class, where you sit? Now, we would want a set of laws, rules. So we say, now, what do we want here? Do we want to be too specific with our laws and rules? Or do we, do we want to be kind of vague? Where do you have more power, if you're vague or if you're specific? No, you're wrong. <laughs> go, to, go, go, go. You're never going to be a good dictator. <laughs> you want the laws vague. Why? Because then you can interpret them. You know, If they're too specific, like the Internal Revenue Code, hey, you've got nowhere to go. So you want them, you want them vague. So the next thing we got to do is we got to sell an idea. Communism is an idea. Capitalism is an idea. We've got to have our idea of what we're doing. And so how do we do that? Well, uh, one way, we sit down and we write a constitution. A constitution according to us. In, in, uh, so we'd want a constitution that would spell out the, the rights of the people. But there we've got to be careful. We don't want to be too broad. don't want to be too narrow. But remember, when you, when you look at a constitution, it's a set of promises sometimes. Let me ask you this. In the US Constitution, does any citizen or anybody have any duty to anybody? Come on, come on, come on. You're all teachers. You're going to get graded on this. You're going to grade me. But how, how about it? Is there any duty in the Constitution? I'm pointing at you at the, sitting right here. I can't see that far. But that's the benefit of being a teacher. You can be vague. Beg your pardon? I would say no. There are no duties in the US Constitution of the citizen or the government. There are negative things, prohibition. But the government doesn't undertake to provide clean air, clean water, or anything else. You think about that. I'm going to talk about That's what I'm going to talk about right now. Hey, as educators, you're in Fat City in China. I'll tell you why. There's a duty in the Constitution for everyone to get an education. Not just a, a broad statement, but a duty, an actual duty written right in there. And there's a duty of parents, of kids to support their parents. I'm all for that. <laughs> but there, there's a whole set of duties in the, in the Constitution that we don't have in the United States Constitution. Our Constitution is based on rights, right? What were we mad about King George? Our Declaration of Independence tells us what the problems were. He put people in our houses, quartered them. He took our people across the seas to be tried, did all kinds of bad things. 
And then our Constitution reflects that, that problem. But what it did was create, in America, in our system, a set of rights. In Asia, as you heard yesterday with Confucianism and Buddhism and so forth, it's based on duties. There are a lot of duties in the Chinese Constitution. Let me just uh, read them, a couple of them to you. Because uh, this is important to, to get a grip on here. First duty, how about this? This is Article 42 of the Constitution, the duty to work. And it not only is a duty to work, it's a glorious duty. Article, well, don't tell the principal, but that's, <laughs> I don't want to create a revolution here. In Article 46, there's a duty of every citizen to receive an education. Now, here's a little tricky thing. This is why I like to be a lawyer. It says every citizen. How about an immigrant? How about someone who's not a citizen? Do they have any duty to work? You bet they don't. It's just the citizens. Now, there's a duty to have family planning. Yes. And a duty to safeguard the unity of the country. And is there any provision in our Constitution that you must obey it? How about it? Someone in the back of the room, at the last table back there. It's a blue shirt. No, you have no duty to obey the Constitution, period. You don't. Now, if we're forming our government, we create these duties. You've got a duty in China to obey the Constitution. That's really important. You've also got a duty for family planning. So what, what's the point I'm making here? When you think about the environment in China, or China going forward into the future, you've got to think of the mindset where people are coming from. And the Constitution is a charter. We have to have a charter that everyone has to read and sing a song and believe in. Or if they don't believe it, they're gonna, they better believe it if they want to eat. So we have a Constitution that the people must obey. And right in the beginning of the Constitution, it says everybody's duty to obey. Now, let me talk about something else here. I'm going to put this up on the screen. And of course, my topic is uh, Bao De Ching Shan Zai, which means Bu Pa Mei Sai Shao, which means if you take care of the Green Mountain, you're going, to you're going to never run out of wood. Same as our body, same as our life. We take care of our physical condition, we're going to be OK. So that's, that's what they say. Now let me show you something here. This is. The key, one of the key provisions of the Chinese Constitution. The exercise by citizens of their freedoms and rights may not infringe upon what? How about it? Just repeat after me. May not infringe upon, come on, we're going to take the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> may not infringe upon the interests of the state and society. And of the collective. OK. Now can everyone, just sing it. The, let's all say, exercise of citizens of their freedoms and rights may not infringe upon the interests of the state. In the United States, what's our concept? The state, no, just the opposite. Come on, come on. The state may not infringe upon the rights of the citizen. Does this give you some hint of the environmental issues in China? Who's calling the shots? Is it the, is it the independent person out there, or is it the state? And in the end, who bows down to whom? Our government's based on the rights of the individual. Now, it's the interests of the state. You go down next. Article 53 of the Constitution says that we protect public property. The government protects public property, and the citizens have that duty. In Article 54, the citizens have a duty to safeguard the interests of the motherland. Is there anything in the United States Constitution that says that? Do you or I have any duty to safeguard the interests of the United States? A duty. Not a, not a, not a feeling, but a duty. Do we? OK, what are you, a communist? <laughs> so, now we're going to go on to something else here. This is the article in the United States Constitution. Do we have anything protecting the snail darter, the water buffalo, 
the water, pollution, anything? No, we have nothing. It's blank. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson didn't think about that. We don't have it. In China, their constitution has provisions for protecting the environment. How do you like this leading into this whole subject, huh? Tricky. Look, this is what to say in a constitution. We're going to come back. Well, I'll start right. Article 9 ensures the rational use of natural resources. And this is what the government has a duty to do. So when you go talk to your Chinese Congressman, they don't have him, but if they had one, this is what you talk about. And protect, Article 22, protect places of scenic and historical interest. Do we have that in, the, in our Constitution? And Article 26.1, protects and improves the living environment and the ecological environment and prevents and remedies other public hazards. That's right in the duties of the government, in the Constitution. This is what they promised to do. OK, so you're a voter. Well, you're not a voter in China. But let's suppose you're a citizen sitting out there in Chengdu someplace, and you're seeing all the rivers polluted. And you go to the president and the premier of China and say, what are we doing here? You've got a duty under the Constitution. First of all, you say, are you a citizen? <laughs> and depending upon the answer, you say, well, you've got this duty out here to uh, protect the environment. And one of the things it does, the Constitution requires the government to en encourage the or afforestation and protection of forests. Bao de Ching Shan Zai, protect the Green Mountain. Now I'm going to, now this is my big moment for the morning. Now let me ask you something here. Has anyone here been teaching less than one year? How about less than five years? OK, I've got two victims. <laughs> you see this up here where it says rational? This is a, ensures what? The rational use of natural resources and protects rare animals. Is there a difference between rational and reasonable? And you can stand up in front and answer the question if you want. <laughs> Come on, you know. You know. Now, what is the difference between rational and reasonable? Is anybody here irrational? Let me ask that question to begin with. Raise your hands. <laughs> is anyone here unreasonable? No, we're all reasonable. Reasonable. Hey, this is, this is great stuff. I'll tell you why. When you think about China, China is an idiomatic language. I mean, it's a pictograph. The language evolved off of pictographs. Which contain specific concepts. OK, in English, we're not a pictographic language. So a lot of people forget that. But as a lawyer, I can tell you, and what I, as you tell your students, every word means something. Every word in our Constitution, every word in the Chinese Constitution means something. Why did they pick, it? Why did they pick rational instead of reasonable? Because they had nothing to do on Saturday morning when the revolution was going on and they had a pen and paper and thought, this is how we do it? No way. Reasonable, now come on, in the back of the room there, no, no, yes, you. What's the difference? Come on, you're going to, A or B, or you can leave the room or no, no, get a cup of coffee. <laughs> well, that's real good. No, that's, that's, I'm proud of you. That's, Yes, here's another one. No, you're right. You're, you're right there. You're right there. Don't give up. You're on the one foot line. No, rational implies there's a, a you have a reason for it. Reason, reasonable implies an agreement or a consensus. So is it reasonable? And, and in, in the law, uh, uh, some parts of the American law and Chinese law say, is it um, reasonable? And, it, and so that's what you look at, is this whole concept. The other thing, like for corporate directors and big corporations, when someone challenges their actions, the judge doesn't say, is it reasonable? Because the judge says, she or he says, I'm not a business person. All I can say is, is it rational? Is it, are these people cuckoo? Or are they 
I'm not going to substitute my judgment for theirs. So rational means there is a reason. So I'm, why am I doing this here? First of all, I want to sharpen you up. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but, but secondly, I want to point, point out to you, when you talk about the environmental protection in China, the standard is, is it rational? And that gives the government a lot of place to go, OK? So you can hear all the, now, but mumbo jumbo. But listen, I'm going to come back again. This is really exciting. Now, China, we're used, and, and I'm, I'm going to devolve in, into, into a religion for a minute. Uh, Buddhism, no, no, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity are all based on principle. They're principle-driven religions. Judaism first, then Christianity, then Islam. Buddhism and Confucianism, first of all, Confucianism is not a religion, but that's not on the final, so you don't have to remember that, <laughs> are not based on principles. They're based on relationships or other right, things, other, but primarily on relationships. Buddhism looks inside, OK? The bo you see what you think. Uh, uh, the others. Uh, Confucianism looks to relationships with the emperor, and you want a virtuous emperor, and so forth. So if you're, if you're living in a society that's driven by Judaism, Islam, or Christianity, you're li living in a society where people can make arguments based on principle. Okay? When you're looking in a society based on Buddhism or Confucianism, you're not. You're looking at it different things. You're looking at, at relationships as the test. Now, let me just uh, flip up here on this exciting screen. Okay, everybody knows the difference between rational and reasonable. Yes. Yes. That's a good, that's a good point. Uh, yes, that's part of it. But rational means something different conceptually. It means a ratio, but a ratio can mean any a judgment factor that, that management makes. Say your principle makes. You say your, your comment to me, this principle may be rational, but it's not reasonable. And then come see me. I'm a lawyer. I'll give you my business card when you're looking for your next job. <laughs> <But> <laughs> I'm going to show you. Now we're going to go someplace else here. And Tom, will you tell me when I'm getting close to the gong? I'm sorry? OK, here we go. Here's the next one. Who owns the resources in China? That came up yesterday. In the communism, communism, the communist state, 49, the government owns all the resources. Three minutes. OK, the government essentially owns the resources. Private property is not part of it. That is a carve out that they're making. So I've got my three minutes. Just going to show you this. This is the Constitution. Who owns it? Mineral resources, water, so forth, are owned by the state. That is, by the whole people, with the exception of what? Forests and mountains and so on. What did they leave out? Who owns the mineral resources and the waters? The government. Now I'm going to just stop because the gong has run. But listen, as teachers, you've got to remember a couple things. China, the concepts are quite different from the United States, the legal concepts. They're, they're based on dignity and respect and fairness, which is quite different from the American system. The American system is based on rights. When you look at the Chinese, there are five uh, points that I, I make about, uh, and I'll just make one more point here. The, the first is a concept of fairness. This goes through the Chinese environmental law and every law. The second is the concept of dignity and morals. And we have prohibitions against the establishment of a religion in our Constitution. China's Constitution provides for moral values, believe it or not, as important. The third is the concept of vagueness uh, uh, and allowing for discretion. And another one is the concept of openness, of lack of finality, that nothing ever ends. I'm going to stop, but it's always moving. China has made a fantastic step forward since this conference was announced. In May, it adopted an environmental protection law. 
It ha it's always had environmental protection laws, but it spread around. It involved a comprehensive scheme. And what's more, they, they established methods of enforcing that law. And it's the greatest thing, again, I'm going to stop right now, but to understand China, when we did our Constitution, George Washington and all the, whoever the drafters were had a concept, and they laid out that concept, three branches of government, all these provisions that have survived to this day. They get, yeah, they get amended. In China, with the environment, what they've done, the same thing they've done with intellectual property, they've established an environmental court to deal with environmental problems, May 14th of this year. And where did they stick it? They didn't stick it in Beijing or Shanghai or Chengdu. They stick it in Fujian province, because the idea is they're going to try it out and see if it works. That's the pragmatic way, of Chinese way of doing things. You don't create the 10-story building. You create the little ground floor and see how it works. So take away for your students the pragmatic part of the Chinese uh, uh, environmental court. And, and of course, the judges have no tenure. The judges can be fired at any time. Uh, and constitutional questions are decided by the National People's Congress. The Congress decides the constitutional questions, not the people. Anyway, that's it. My closing comment for you all would be the Chinese saying, Bu Pa Man, Zhou Pa John, which means don't be afraid of going slow, just be afraid of standing still. And China is no way standing still. It's moving ahead in this area, dealing with our environmental protection agency. And eventually, thanks to Kristen and her act activists, we'll be making big changes. Thank you very much. Thank you.